close to here. This meeting is being recorded. Lucas, thank you, and, and good evening to, to everyone. It's great to see so many people here uh, tonight. My, my name is Paul McLennan. I'm the MSP for uh, East Lothian, and I'm convener of the Cross Party Group on uh, Wellbeing uh, Economy. I'll give you a little bit of background to myself, then I'll introduce uh, our, our guests. I know I'm joined by a few other uh, MSP colleagues, and I'll let them introduce themselves at, at the appropriate stage. And uh, my background, I, I was elected in, in May uh, as a new uh, MSP. Uh, previously, I was 15 years a councillor and a previous council leader in, uh, in East Lothian uh, as well. One of the key things that came through for me in the first, I suppose, first few months of being an MSP, the phrase the wellbeing economy was mentioned time after time in speeches. Um, but I think if you asked every MSP who mentioned it, um, you would probably get a, 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 a different interpretation of what the wellbeing economy was. So for me, there was a real clear need to start a cross-party group on the wellbeing economy to try and define what it actually means and, and, and what we need to do to try and move towards a wellbeing economy. And hopefully tonight's um, um, exercise and tonight's uh, meeting will, will, will help us demonstrate that. And of course, it's, it's, it's entitled How Should We Measure Economic uh, Performance? And, Today I was in the chamber and we were talking about Scotland's national parks and we talked about legacies and my hometown is Dunbar and many of you may know that John Muir was born in Dunbar and obviously was the, the founder of the national parks movement in the US and he's certainly left his legacy and we talked to him about the impact on the wellbeing economy and the importance of the national parks um, in that. So I think that, that was rather apt coming from that debate into here to, to, today. So. Um, the key things I think for me is the Scottish Government is moving towards a target of looking towards uh, through its national strategy for economic transformation about trying to get a wellbeing economy by 2032 and one of the things that was talking about was looking at a, a wellbeing monitor so what exactly should we be monitoring and, and our movement towards 2032 so tonight is very apt I have a meeting coming up with the Scottish Government uh, on that so you know I think tonight I'll let, obviously feed in into that. So it's great to see everybody here tonight. I think um, Lucas has touched around about um, how we're going to phrase uh, the, tonight's meeting. So I'm going to introduce our guests um, in a little minute uh, and, uh, and they'll come on and screen and just say hello. Um, we've got a couple of set questions just to get us going and then I think Lucas has touched around about what we need to do beyond that to um, you know to try and get some some debate. So please feel free to, to contribute as best you can. Um, either let me know or put your, your, your question in, in the chat. So uh, I'm going to introduce our guests and I'll ask them to come on and, and just say a, a quick hello in, in, in regards. So the first speaker tonight is Denisha Aquilo and she's a trustee of the Wellbeing uh, Economy Alliance in Scotland, represents Scotland at the Future Donations Commission for the UK. She is currently leading the Scottish Government funded National Childhood Bereavement Project delivered by Includem and has previously been a co-chair at the Independent Care Review. Denisha, uh, thank you and, and welcome uh, to, to the meeting tonight. Thank you, Paul. I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually on annual leave, so I'm cheating by being here because I'm going on holiday tomorrow. But if I was going to cheat, oh, well. I'm very, very glad it was there. So, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Denisha. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Margaret Feeling. Uh, Margaret's a senior policy analysis specialised in the use of wellbeing frameworks and evidence to inform and design better public policy. She's extensive experience working across the public sector internationally, including for the OECD, the New Zealand government, and the Dutch Ministry of Health, Wellbeing and Sport, as well as working with local councils to support a wellbeing policy approach. Margaret, welcome. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction. Uh, our next speaker uh, and, uh, is, is Rutger Hoekstra, and Rutger has experience, extensive experience researching and working in Beyond GDP, and is the founder of metricsforthefuture.com. Uh, he is author of the book, Replacing GDP by 2030, and, and the WE and Wellbeing Alliance briefing paper, Measuring Wellbeing Economy, How to Go Beyond GDP. He's worked with the World Bank, KPMG, the European Central Bank, and the OECD, amongst others, on measuring economic progress to meet the challenges of this century. Rutger, welcome. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Looking forward to, uh, to the next hour. Okay. Thank you very much. Our final speaker. Um, is Jen Wallace. Uh, Jen is a public policy analyst and writer. She's held a range of positions in the public and voluntary sector and is currently director at Carnegie UK, where she applies a wellbeing approach to government policy and promotes wellbeing as a narrative for social change. She has written extensively on this topic and has a specific interest and expertise in the role of wellbeing approaches in small jurisdictions. She currently leads a team that produces gross domestic wellbeing, an alternative measure for social progress and programmes on wellbeing in Northern Ireland in the North of Tyne region of England. She's also chair of the What Works Centre for Wellbeing Advisory Panel, 
and as a member of the REF 2021 main panel for the social sciences. Jen, welcome. Hello, it's lovely to be here and I need to learn to condense my biography. Sorry, you had to read that out, Paul. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So just to say thank you for our four panelists. I think you'd, you'd all agree we've got a fantastic panel here tonight. I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion. Now, we've got the benefit of asking the, um, the first question, and I'm going to ask our speakers to, to respond, probably in the same order that we, we talked, uh, that I introduced them. So the first question uh, that we've got tonight is, why do you care about how we measure economic performance? Uh, Denisha, I'll probably come to yourself first of all and just go through the, the order that we introduced everybody. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I was thinking about this question, and I think um, for me personally, the economy and economics has always felt something out of reach to me. Um, I studied politics, social policy at uni, and even then I still felt like I didn't have the right to have an opinion on it because I didn't fully understand it. And what I've come to realise um, through my work at We All and also just my work in terms of participation and inclusion, this is exactly the point of our current economic system. It should feel confusing to those it isn't designed to benefit, a system that is set up to benefit a few, would never act in the best interest of the many. And I think that's a key problem. Um, and when I first started to understand the economy as something different than what it means in terms of how much money you have and turn instead about how we have the means to live freely and fully, that's when I realized the importance of transforming it from that to being something that matters to people and really, really quantifies the economy instead of looking at it in terms of how many cars or how much money someone has or how much billionaires there are that have got to where they are of exploita exploitation of working class people we're looking at about what it means to live and what it means to live freely and how do you, how do we all have a quality of life that isn't hindered by poverty or isn't hindered by struggling to make ends meet and i think that for me was what made me fall in love with the all and well-being economy as an idea because it does mean something much more than how much money you have in the bank, but actually what is what matters to us as a country, as a nation, of how we make sure that our people and our citizens have the right means to live. So I think that's why I care so much about it. And I think from someone in my own background of working with children care, people in poverty, and um, people of colour, all these sorts of different intersectionalities, I really see the importance of making sure that our economic system does not discriminate and does not marginalise people. Sorry, my apologies, the error there, I forgot to unmute. Sorry, Marguerite, I'm going to bring in, bring in yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think the reason, the reason why I think that all of this work is so important is because of course we need an economy that works for people and planets rather than the other way around. Um, to me, importantly, a well-being approach doesn't only mean measuring things differently, but it requires a new way of working together, both within the system of government as well as with citizens and the private sector. I think that for a well-being economy, for well-being economy frameworks to have real impacts, they need to become whole government and even more so whole society frameworks. Um, I spent most of my time over the last 15 years in New Zealand, where I worked for the New Zealand Treasury when the well-being budget process was adopted. And it has been fascinating to see how by embedding well -being, the well-being framework into their budget process, the New Zealand Living Senate framework evolved from a treasury internal framework to become a central framework in terms of government's agenda setting and policy development. Not only are budget priorities based on a comprehensive scan of well-being, including current uh, and future well-being, as well as inequalities, but once budget priorities in New Zealand have been defined, government agencies are, are required to work together to put forward budget bids that target the overarching well-being priorities. And so as a result, for example, the 2019 New Zealand budget saw as many as 10 different agencies coming together to jointly put in a budget bid to help address issues of family violence. Now, I think this really speaks to the fact that, of course, ultimately the point of more holistic measurement is to encourage more holistic policy approaches. Now, with regard to my second point about the importance of making it a whole of society framework, um, I think that for any framework to become a successful motor for change, a broad social license is key. In the complex world that we live in, there's no single person or organization that holds a range of knowledge 
or controls the range of actions that are required to meet desired outcomes. And so collaboration with businesses, communities, and citizens is crucial to have real impact. And I think there's huge poten potential for well-being economy frameworks to offer the vision and strategic framework that guides that collaboration and that brings um, people together. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I'm sure I've got a few questions going to bear in my head already, but I'll, I'll, I'll open all of them up to people <laughs> before I, I'll do that. It, it, Ruka, I'll bring yourself in on that one. Yeah, I guess my interest really in the whole GDP debate uh, goes back to my time when I started working at Statistics Netherlands as a young 20 something. And uh, I'd always been really interested in environmental problems. But when I was at Statistics Netherlands, what's so perhaps obvious is that when there is a, a uh, you know, a, a new number on the economy, then the journalists just pack into the auditorium for the press conference. And then when we, we had loads of statistics on social issues, on environmental issues, and just the, the, the no, amount of attention really paid to those numbers was just um, so much less, really. And so uh, at some stage, I was given the opportunity to lead the well-being economy uh, monitor for, for the Netherlands. Um, and we started developing. And basically, the rationale that we saw was that you know, if, if these numbers are attracting so much attention in the media, the GDP, it also reflects, I think, a larger discussion that we are talking perhaps too much about the economy in our societies. And we do need to talk more about things like well-being, sustainability in the sense of future well-being, and also uh, inclusion. So I guess that's my own uh, journey in this uh, process and I guess uh, in, in the other questions I can say a little bit more about how uh, you know perhaps that might be achieved. Yeah Riker thank you very much and I'm going to bring in uh, Jen. Jen same question. Great thank you and it was lovely to listen to those answers and I'll try very hard not to repeat things that you've, you've already said um, but Marguerite was talking about the, the importance of holistic statistics and I think that's also where we come into this from, from Carnegie um, I've been part of the, the Scottish uh, story on well-being for 10 years now uh, and my interest in this question is because somehow despite best intentions and brilliant people we keep getting it wrong um, so something that we are doing is not working um, here despite all of the rhetoric about wanting to move to a well-being economy and wanting to move to inclusive growth and I think that in itself is, is fascinating I'm sure we'll be able to talk about that a little bit more as we go through that that context because there's certainly no disagreement at top level on what the vision is for Scotland um, and what the statement is in our national performance framework but in the translation of that statement through outcomes and indicators into policies and practice something is getting lost and I find that whole process of implementation and the implementation gap really really interesting. So, of course, we know from Stieglitz and Fatuzzi, um, the eminent economists, that uh, what, what gets measured is what gets done. And, and that's why we are focusing on this, because measurement is a way to lever change in a really complex system of public administration. And we have an intensely complex system in Scotland between agencies, local government, central government, and uh, the, the number of bodies that are involved who all need to come around something so that they know the change that they're trying to make. And we do that through our national outcomes and through our national indicators. Um, some of those relate to the economy. And the economy indicator said doesn't just include GDP, entrepreneurial activity, productivity, and so on. It also includes income inequalities. It includes contractually secure work. It includes economic participation, employee voice, all the things that we had a long project at Carnegie on job quality. And we're highly supportive of these measures being in there. And yet this afternoon, I got a little bit curious and I went on to the Scottish Parliament website um, and checked out uh, how, how many times certain things get mentioned in the chamber. Um, so although GDP is only one of 81 national indicators, it was mentioned directly in 162 debates in the chamber over the past 12 months. The National Performance Framework gets only 89 itself. The news is a bit better on living wage. It gets 123 mentions. So that's good in terms of the, the economy and a transition to a better economy. Income inequality, 114. 
it's not bad, 107 on social capital. I feel a little bit sorry for natural capital, how we measure the quality of our environment. Only gets 83 mentions in Parliament over the past 12 months, and our poor little carbon footprint has a measly 34 mentions. So in our national indicators, these things are all meant to be equal. In our national debate, they are absolutely not equal. So I will continue focusing on this with you all until we work out what it is that is missing in our implementation of our vision through to our practice. Thank you. Jen, thank you for that. And, and again, a very intriguing uh, opening to that. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions come out of that. The, the next question really is just going on about, and we kind of almost touched on it, is why do you think governments are still focused on GDP growth? I mean, we've known about the flaws for so long, and I suppose what what are the barriers that you kind of see to why um, the governments are still focused on on GDP? Is it all is it about intention, or is it around about I suppose in terms of exactly what is a well-being economy? Is, does that still need to be defined a little bit more? And, and it, Margie, I'll probably come to yourself first of all. Obviously, you mentioned about your experience in, in New Zealand, and you know, I suppose what what positive lessons are to be learned from, from that. And I'll probably come to Ruka after that and then open it up again. But, um, Margie, just open up to yourself that question. Yes, of course. Um, I think the focus on economic growth is very hardwired in our way of thinking, as well as in our organizational culture, structures and processes. So it's not only in how we do governance, it's in how we do business, how we live together, how we educate our young people. Um, to the extent that even when we talk about well-being economies, there's often this sort of tendency to want to convince the audience that wider well-being considerations are good for economic growth also, which is of course beyond the point. Um, and I think that Kate um, Roworth has expressed it very well in that a healthy economy should be designed to thrive whether it grows or not. A particular challenge in this regard um, is how to encourage long-term thinking in a short-term world. So I think better anchoring social and environmental boundaries which is something they're working on in New Zealand right now as well, in our decision-making is key. And perhaps a weakness that I see in many existing wellbeing policy frameworks is that while they outline the different domains and dimensions of our collective wellbeing, they often stay very silent in terms of how these domains interrelate and how they connect together. For example, that without a healthy planet, we simply cannot live and there is no economy. So to me, the question is, how can we better anchor these environmental and social boundaries in our well-being frameworks and subsequent decision making? Um, and that was one of the things that was raised recently as well by the New Zealand Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, who looked specifically at how the well-being budget um, has helped in terms of uh, environmental outcomes. In that even though it's helped in, in uh, making these considerations more explicit, um, there's still a tendency to discount future outcomes. So I think that is definitely, yeah, that's an important, um, an important focus point. Uh, Margie, thank you for that. Ruka, I'm going to bring yourself in next and probably just touching on the point that, that might be made. Uh, are politicians the blocker in this? And, and the reason I'm saying that is obviously every politician will look at obviously what the short-term goals are, but it's maybe the longer-term thinking that's kind of neglected. So I, I'm going to be asking you to open up on that, but are politicians part of the problem here in terms of that? It's maybe an obvious question. When they're looking at short-term gains, but it's a longer-term thinking that we need. Um, and again, where are you seeing maybe the barriers and opportunities around about a uh, developing economy as well? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, it might be a popular position to blame for politicians sometimes, but I wouldn't actually go there. Um, no, I, I, well, in my book, the analysis that I gave is, is actually kind of an analysis of what Marfait said how did it become entrenched in, in our society? What, why is it the de facto way of organizing our society? And um, what's really interesting is actually that economists really converged around this way of measuring GDP in the system of national accounts after the war. And it's fairly, uh, you know, it's fairly unique that 200 countries are producing every quarter exactly the same number with the same system of statistics um, and what they did built on top of that was not just that all statistical bureaus produce that four times a year, but also the models. So the economic models that we need sometimes as policymakers to actually think through what a certain scenario is, you know, uh, 
wonderful, uh, loads of research has been done on macroeconomic modeling. And when, you know, when you see the well-being economy frameworks in that from that lens, I do think we have a bit of a problem that globally speaking, there are just so many uh, systems and indicators. And, and I can imagine that the media, politicians and the general public sometimes get a bit confused about how many different types there are. So in my book, I, I did stress also that I do believe that there should be some international coordination because I've been researching the commonality between all these systems. And there's so many commonalities uh, actually uh, across the board. And if I would return that to the Scottish situation, I do think Scotland is also a really important part of the We Go uh, coalition. The, those are five or six of the most important countries in terms of well-being economy. And up to now, I do find it, you know, for the last three years, we've been hearing about this coalition of governments. But to be quite frank, we have been a little bit disappointed as a well-being economy community internationally about what has been coming out of that community. It hasn't been acting very much as a leader, uh, I think. Up to now, it's been very much just the fact that we have a coalition is great. But I think th these group of countries could actually also provide some leadership when we're trying to, to globalize this, um, this agenda. Right, good, thank you for that. And I, I'm sure we'll touch on that about how, how we, we do that in a, in a suppose in an interconnected world and the importance of that. And I'm going to bring in Jen and Denisha and, and maybe try and ask you about what, what are the lessons, I suppose, Jen, from in Scotland and, or in that, the same with Denisha, we've heard around about what's happening in other parts of the world. Is, is there lessons that Scotland can learn about how it, it progresses towards moving away from GDP? Um, and, and, and having a look, look, a look at other measures as there are lessons that we can learn from what Margaret said and what Rutger said. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things from the New Zealand experience, as I understand it, is the way that they took the statistics and then put it into their policymaking processes. Um, so they didn't leave it as a dashboard off to the side, but they integrated it into the budget process and the decision making process. And that's something that Scotland has found really, really difficult to do. Um, so, you know, for example, the public finance manual hasn't been updated to take account of any of this. Um, and, and there are there are issues there are blockers in the system that are actually relatively easy to unblock um, but I think there needs to be more more drive you know more momentum and more of a push behind it I think I think for many of us in Scotland you know it would be surprising to know that in the international community we're considered to be a leader on well-being approaches to government or on a well-being economy and um, because that's not how we talk about it you know we, we don't generally see ourselves in that way and we don't see the national outcomes as the top of a, a pinnacle of frameworks for improving all of our, our outcomes for, for Scotland. So I think there is, a, you know, that there are, if not, you know, absolutely transferable solutions from New Zealand and from the work that Richard's done on more than GDP, there are definitely signposts along the way that we can follow so that we can get a better system going forward. Jen, thank you for that. Denisha, the same question? Um, right around about focusing on Scotland and what you think the lessons that Scotland could learn? Yeah, I, th I think there is lots of lessons, and I, you know, um, as a trustee at Wheel Scotland as well, I always find it very um, amazing when other countries look to us and see the great work that we're doing. And it is credit to all the third sector organisations, public offices, public sector, absolutely great amount of work, particularly grassroots communities as well, and the work they're doing to try and champion a wellbeing economy. Um, and I, I think what it comes down to to me is what are we actually doing to benefit the lives of everyday people? So we know that the cost of living crisis is worse than ever. One in four children in Scotland grow up in poverty. We have all these really big issues. What is actually being done to improve them? We do have things like sustainable development goals, national performance framework. We look at other different measures as well, the World Happiness Report, gross national happiness. We look at all these different things, but actually how does this translate at a really basic level to an everyday person going to work or raising a family what does that mean to them and I think when we talk about that and we talk about real people's lives I think that's what's important I think that's what's missing right now um this is no disrespect to politicians in the room as well um but when a system is set up to design and it's designed in a way that is only made by a few people around the table so whether that be people with power and privilege they can only ever design something from their own, own worldview or their own experiences and understanding that misses out actually the key of the issue so we need to take a bit 
of a step back because even the most well-read and well-meaning politicians, they can never be a substitute for real diversity and real experiences. And I think that's something really important. And I see that in my line of work. I've walked, I've worked extensively, um, I guess, in se sectors of people who have less often heard in parts of communities and also as well, it is really, really what matters to them. You know, we've talked about poverty for how long now? So long and the cost of living crisis as well. It was never, we knew the cost of living crisis was going to happen. And it seems like we're now just kind of reactively sorting it. So we're doing, you know, we're trying to battle right now with failure demand expenditure. How can we actually patch up different things? Can we create food bags to alleviate food poverty? But actually we're missing, we're missing the trick here. If you want to fix poverty, ask people who have been in poverty, who've been pushed into poverty, what pushed them there? And they will tell you how to solve it. And there we need to design solutions. So actually what, what really matters to me, and this question is really important, is how do we shake up the power structures that exist and get people with real experiences in the room to design what they want and what will benefit their lives? And I think that right now, we do this in different sectors. The independent care we did this really well with uh, people with care experience, but we really need to go further and really take this seriously. And I think that in terms of future proofing our policies and thinking beyond just parliamentary term of what's in politically and what really really will make sure that our ancestors our future generations will really really be able to thrive and not come up against barriers at the cost of living crisis again that's what matters denisha thank you for that and and, and that was a four really passionate answers so uh, but what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask obviously people to to start thinking about a question before i do that i am being joined by by two of my parliamentary colleagues as pam duncan glancy um, and, and Morris Golden. So I'm going to ask, uh, first of all, Pam, just to introduce herself, say hello uh, and say a few words. I know there's a part at the end for Pam to, to come in that and then Morris as well. So Pam, I don't know if you, if you can come on screen and just say a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself and, and, and obviously then Morris, and then we'll open up to the floor for questions. And I know there's a bit at the end for, for Pam and Morris to, to reflect on what they've heard so far as well as myself. But Pam, do you want to come on and just say hello and introduce yourself very briefly? Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you so much um, for tonight. I'm sorry that I haven't had my camera on. I've just actually um, finished travelling. So um, I've been I've been listening intently. And I have to say, it's been one of the most interesting discussions I've joined in a long, long time. And particularly um, taken, actually, by, um, by the comments we've just heard around the, the links between inequality and lived experience and how that plays out in, in uh, an economy. And really um it goes back to the point that that, that you also made earlier then um, about the fact that when you start to discuss economy you think oh do, i'm not really sure if i know enough about this and then you think well it's because it wasn't designed for people like me and uh, i don't i don't know about you paul but um i'm sure that uh, probably all politicians at some point have felt a little bit like that when they um, when they start um, in this job uh, but, but I know I really have um, and I, I've honestly felt like I, I'm certainly not the wisdom on everything and so um, by any stretch and none of us are and so the point about we can only represent our experience um, is a really really well made point and it's why we need to increase representation in order to um, redesign the economy and of course that that can be quite circular um, as well um, but I, I just think that was such an incredibly powerful point thank you. Um, thank you for that. And, uh, Morris, I'll bring in yourself just to get a quick introduction again and, and your, your initial thoughts at this stage. Thanks, Paul. It's been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, I think that um, in terms of some of the views, particularly from Denisha, about shaking up the status quo, I think the key is that when we move to a more diverse parliament, actually that diversity shapes a new elite because ultimately what we don't want to do is just change the elite that's running politics with a different vanguard and you know i i joined the scottish parliament in 2016 i would say that the the best politicians are those that look for short-term gains that look and understand the media hits and are conversely the worst representatives of the people. And I'd make a quite a distinction between a politician and a representative. Uh, I think very few people can do both, but uh, some people perhaps can. And, you know, I was really encouraged to hear about the different metrics that can be used. So my background is climate change. I'm not an expert in the well-being economy. I'm a, I'm an economist to trade, so I can speak about 
GDP and uh, GVA, um, but in terms of the problems we've had in the circular economy are almost identical to the well-being economy in the sense that you get a lot of warm words, but how do you get the action? And it's not just actions from the Scottish government, the UK government, it's actions from the public sector, the private sector. How do you ensure that in the terms of the well-being economy, that all those different actors are moving in the same way. And you know, I, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on how we do that. Morris, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and, and thanks to, to Morris and Pam for giving their, their, their uh, analysis of where we are just now. Um, Lucas, uh, just obviously mentioned in about, you know, if you want to raise your hand in, in the chat or put a question in, uh, in the chat and, and um, so we can open it up to, to, to that. Um, does anybody have a question at, at this stage? Um, I'm maybe picking a few people who have made comments, if, if not. So um, I'm not seeing any hands up or anything in the chat just now. Um, I was going to bring in, and, and both I, both have mentioned this, about Meg Thomas and, and, and uh, Doreen Grove have mentioned around about participatory um, democracy. Meg, Doreen, I don't know if you want to just mention a little bit. You, you mentioned both in the comments about that. Uh, Meg, maybe pick on yourself just around about the reason why you see that, that that's important, and I'll open it up there if, if you can come on the screen or, or just ask your question or make the point that you made around about the importance of participating. There you go. Yeah. Um, Meg, just to, just to uh, maybe elaborate on the point that you made, because I think it's really important and we've kind of heard this just around about how important that is. I think, um, so I work with Denisha at Includem um, and participation is at the heart of what we do. And we support children and young people and families who are um, often um, over involved in the system um, those who have been part of the system for such a long time and have a huge distrust in the system. But what they tell us more and more is these decisions are made on their behalf without anyone talking to them or assuming that these systems will work for them or be best for them without actually talking to them. So I guess the challenge is, um, you know, I've really valued what everyone has had to say today. I think it's amazing that we have such experts in the room talking about it, but we need to remember that there are experts by experience, not just experts by learning. And how do we include them in this conversation? They won't be represented today, for example. They probably don't even know that a cross-party group exists. So how do we go out and, um, and understand from them what would truly work? Because they're the ones who are most adversely affected. They're the ones who have poor wellbeing outcomes, poor health outcomes, poor education outcomes, um, and will be the least able to engage in some of these systems. So it's just a challenge, I think. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Meg, thanks for that. I'm, I'm going to, I know Margaret's got her hand up there and I'll bring in a wee second. I, I know D Doreen, you mentioned that there's something, some, something similar. I don't know if you want to just touch on the point around about participatory democracy as well, and then I'll bring in Margaret when, and on that issue. Doreen, do you want to come in and just say a little bit about the point that you made? Yeah. Um, I, can you hear me? Yeah, we've got you okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. It's just it was saying the host was blocking me. Um, uh, something I find all the time. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, sort of, so to declare who I am, um, I, I'm Doreen Grove. I'm a head of open government for Scottish Government, um, but, but in what's laughingly known as my spare time, I'm also chair of We All. Um, uh, and so, and the, the reason that I've been so deeply involved in, uh, in both is because exactly what Denisha said. We can't have a system uh, that, that doesn't actually go to the people furthest from government first, unless we can find means and mechanisms to do that and do it in a way that makes people feel valued um, so that it's not, we're not creating yet another extractive industry, uh, but, but we're being properly thoughtful uh, about who needs to be in what room at what time. Um, so the open government work we're doing in, in government is looking at uh, how we uh, really create um, a right through our system, ways that, and, and tools and um, uh, expertise on how you involve people, whether that is through citizen assemblies, citizen juries, whether it's at community level, um, in deliberative discussions or participatory budgeting. There's not one single answer and we shouldn't look for a silver bullet. Uh, but what we should do uh, is be really thoughtful uh, about who's most affected by whatever it is we're trying to do 
at whatever level uh, and um, start there uh, and really listen uh, and not just um, uh, do, uh, you know, for, for um, get a, a, a plan of what we want to do and go out and say, is that okay? Uh, because actually that's not the way to do it. Uh, you need to start co-producing and designing from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the start and you need to include people in that. And, and I, the, the thing I put in the chat is um, uh, it often is something that uh, politicians find a bit scary um, uh, because it sounds as if that's a sort of power grab. Uh, two things, I don't think power is a zero sum game. Uh, I think we can all gain um, from a greater involvement. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of evidence internationally um, that, that societies that do use more participative methods, uh, politicians are, are better elected anyway. Um, so, so you're all okay, guys. Doreen, thank you for that. I, I'm going to bring in uh, Marguerite and, and Jen, who both had their hand up in the air, because I think the question, and, and I asked Rutger and, and Denise to comment on this as well, is around about how, how can we involve, you know, how can we be as participate, participatory as, as much as we can? It's not just seen, I suppose the question is, it's not just seen and as a chat in the wellbeing economy, um, I suppose, grouping or people interested in it. It's not just seen as politicians, but how, how do the everyday public get to you know appreciate what we're trying to do here? So how do we involve them? And Margaret, I know you had your hand up first, then I'll bring in Jen, and I know Pam wanted to come in on this one as well. So um, so I'll go Margaret, Jen, and then, and then Pam, and then Rutger and Deesha, if you want to contribute, then, then put your hand up and let me know. But Margaret, you, you had your hand up there, first of all. Yes, fully agree with the importance of, of incorporating that live, lived experience. And I think thinking about the well-being economy framework development, um, it comes back to how the framework is being developed as well. And the importance um, for these frameworks to become real motors for societal change and to build these new coalitions of change, the importance of involving um, citizens, business leaders, community representatives, a broad section, you know, the a broad cross section of people all across society, right from the beginning in the development of the framework itself and in the identification of meaningful progress indicators so that it's not a technocratic exercise, but that it's about developing a vision for the future of Scotland that, is, that resonates with um, everybody in Scotland. Um, and I think there are very inspiring examples of it, actually, of what that collaboration could look like. And one of them that comes to mind for me is the Donut Economy Coalition in Amsterdam, where public, private and civil society actors have come together to not only jointly define what progress looks like, but to also collaborate in working towards these objectives. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret, thank you for that. Jen, I know you just hand up, then I'll bring in Pam. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so one of the comments that we get about um, public engagement in this field is that people don't really care about statistics and measurement, um, and that is that is just certainly not our experience. You know, um, so we've you know we've done groups in Scotland working with Oxfam Scotland, and um, we've done groups in the north of Tyne developing their wellbeing frameworks very similar to Scotland's, um, and and we found people you know ready and willing to engage with you know questions around what matters to you, you know what contributes to your wellbeing, what kind of place do you want to live in, what helps you thrive in your community. You know, people have no problem at all engaging with that there is an element of you know sort of a technocratic solution into in terms of how you ask those questions and the scales that you use but we need to get this the right way around the people tell us what matters to them and then the experts go away and find out the best way to you know to construct an instrument to measure that not the other way around thank you okay Jen, like Pam um, yeah, thank, thanks very much, Paul, for, for bringing me back in. And actually, Jen, I think you've just started there to, to answer the, the point I was I was going to make. Um, and it was really around how do we get over this point that you made earlier about the complexities in Scotland around different frameworks, different measurements, because, um, I, you know, I said earlier, the, the value of lived experience and bringing it into the room as often as we can is really, really important. Um, but it's also it, it's also important that people can do that in a way that, that is meaningful as well um, and that we try and cut through some of the complexities of it. So I guess I would, I would just be keen to hear what, what people's views are on, on that. And then the other, the, the other area around um, participation in, in this particular um, 
field has often been that when when people get involved per, for example in participatory budgeting and i know that um that's not the same as as what this is because it's measuring slightly different things and actually maybe there's something to learn there um, and to bring across from it um, but often people um, get concerned that really they're just being brought in to decide where 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 things are going to cut and where things are going to um, no longer be funded. Is there a is there a way that we can use what you've learned and what um, internationally on the well being economy to improve those kind of processes so that that's they're not I suppose zero sum games um, as well. Pam, thank you for that. I'm going to bring in, Denisha, you had your hand up there, and Ruger, if you want to come in, and then I'm going to slightly open up. There's been a few other questions, and I'll try and open that up as well. Denisha? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, kind of touching a bit on what Jen and Pam have said, and a few others as well, I think we talk about stuff like this and what how we can make sure we break down those barriers. I think it comes back to me about language and accessibility. So, um, I talk about this quite a lot as a trustee at Wheel Scotland. I'm always kind of pushing of like, okay, well, the language we use right now, we need to not fall into the trap of talking like academics and um, how can we actually talk like real people? And this is something I find, it's quite funny, I actually did a four year degree and I feel like now doing work, I feel like I'm unlearning my degree every single day because I'm like, I can't talk like that anymore. Um, but the one thing I will say about my degree is a report that's always stuck in my head and I can't for life me remember who wrote it, but it was called like, um, the rainforests don't mean much here. And I read it for one of my social policy classes and I just found it was amazing because it was talking, it was like people in Glasgow and local communities and someone went out and spoke to them about environmentalism. And these young boys were just like, well, rainforests don't mean much to me here. And they kind of thought about the environment as something that was way over in the Amazon that had nothing really representative to them. But actually we know that the environment means absolutely everything. It means the roads that you walk on, the house that you live in, how much green space you have around you. And I think that's really, really key. So when we use these sorts of languages, it doesn't feel representative to the people we're actually really wanting to get into the room. Um, and I think that is something really important. We always need to check ourselves and check what we're saying. You know, sustainable development goals, national performance framework are great what does it mean to everyday people if it's really, really confusing? And I think that is something we constantly need to go back and make sure we're challenging ourselves with. And um, Pam, I watched your election campaign in absolute awe, and I was really, really, um, you know, I found it really, really inspiring the first few weeks of you when you were um, sitting in Parliament and you were talking about how actually, you know, we build up the Scottish Parliament somewhere really accessible and you were talking about actually, well, here are my barriers as a wheelchair user. And I find that really, really powerful and I think that brought back to a wider point of how the Scottish Parliament have always tried to claim of being really accessible but lots of stuff that people were calling for and we saw a massive amount of women MSPs stepping down because of childcare and other sort of things but then during Covid all this became more accessible so I think we have a responsibility to constantly keep checking ourselves even at the most powerful institutions in the country to keep making sure that for everyday people and everyday everyday citizens we do feel representative and the language you use matters to them and we give them equitable opportunities to be able to have their voice heard and I think that is something that we can fall risk at running away with when we have conversations about a well-being economy because even the term I mean can be very very confusing unless you understand it as I said at the start of the session I used to think that the economy meant absolutely nothing to me and I studied politics at uni so we really need to make sure we break down things and challenge ourselves in how we're talking. Thanks for that. Rutger, do you want to add anything to that that you've heard so far? And then I'm going to open up another question. Yeah, I, I guess for the sake of discussion, I'd also like to um, I'd like to advocate actually more of a combined approach between science and so bottom up and top down actually combined. Um, I think one of the most interesting processes of the last 30 years, years has been the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which basically galvanized scientific thought about climate change. And now that has actually developed into citizens panels, actually discussing solutions. And I think that's actually a really good example where sometimes there are things that science can bring to bear to the discussion. And there are really important perspectives from uh, citizens about their priorities of what solutions they, they think there should be. So I would actually advocate not top down or bottom up, but actually a combination of the two. Um, and, you know, I, I think there are really fruitful ways of, of tackling that. But there are also, I think, pitfalls in deliberative processes. And I'd love to hear about kind of the best examples, because 
in a deliberative process, you also want it to be as democratic as possible or to actually give more voice to the people that are suffering most, perhaps. But at any stage, you know, some kind of power dynamic does uh, start to arrive. And so what is the best way to actually organize that deliberative process? And I would argue for the sake of discussion for today also, I, I don't actually believe it should be only the citizens that, because as uh, Margrit was saying, there are trade-offs between various goals. And if a citizen says, I want all this, that, that, and the other, we all know that sometimes you will have to sacrifice certain targets in a society for other things. And that's, you know, that's the scientific part of, of seeing what feasible options there are. So, so I, I would actually advocate for a really good deliberative process combined with a really good scientific process uh, and actually combine the two. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and Jen, I just noticed that a, a, a comment you put in about Pam's question, but just generally in the discussion we talked about, it's in about Pam's question. There's an opportunity to push Scottish government for better, deeper participation on the review of national outcomes and the development of the wellbeing economy monitor. I think that's incredibly important. It's how we get to that, obviously, and, and how we participate that, and uh, how we how participate uh, we are, we're in that. The, the one question that kind of moved on, and I'm going to kind of pick on a few people as well, it's kind of raised on this is, Roger, I don't have your second name, so my my apologies, and I'm going to uh, bring you in in a wee second. Just talking about one of the questions is, how do we recognise many things of value for wellbeing that are not easily measurable? Um, and I just wondered if you want to comment on that at all and bring you in, just to probably expand on that, if, if that's okay. If you're still there, Roger. Hi there. Roger. My name's Roger Mullen. We have met Paul. <laughs> I, I, oh, I, Roger, I didn't, I didn't get your second name. So I know, I know Roger, I know who you are. I don't know if you want to just expand on, on that. Yes, OK. My name's Roger Mullen. And uh, basically what I was doing was setting a challenge to a lot of what I have heard so far. And basically it's be careful not to fall in the same trap as some of the types of economists that you criticize in the past and reducing everything that you think everything can be reduced to measurable forms. There are some things that are hugely important, at least I think they are hugely important to society. I mentioned just for example, justice. Justice to me is something that needs to be explored qualitatively, not something that needs to be reduced to a metric. And if we lose the sense of the types of phenomena in society that are important, if we're only going to consider those that can be reduced to a metric, then you're going to fail in exactly the same way as I believe neoclassical economics has failed. Here endeth the lesson. <laughs> yeah, Roger. Thank you for that. I didn't know it was yourself because, uh, as I said, I, I just seen the first name. I, I'm going to bring in Vicky as as Evero as well. And Vicky, you can add a lead up. You had a kind of follow on question to, to Roger, obviously mentioning about about that as, as well. I don't know if you want to come in and just elaborate the point that you mentioned. It's it, it's related to what uh, Roger said, and then I'll open it up to the panel. Let's see. Are you there, Vicky? I am. Yeah. I am. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, this is a conversation that is so important because I don't know when I hear Roger say to reduce justice to something measurable, why is it that we're not saying to expand justice to something that is measurable? If it's that important in our society, if ecosystems and biodiversity are that important, why is it that we're not challenging ourselves to have a different accounting ledger? It's the ledger that we are pretending is something that is fixed and that we're not willing to change. This is not reductionism. This is trying to put forward that these, the well being economy, the components of that economy generate wealth. And that was the point with the little fishermen that I was trying to make. When you have biodiversity, when you have clean air, children don't have neurodevelopmental delays. They don't have other psychological problems. These are things that are proven, but we, with our net present value 
um, accounting don't want to take that long-term view to get to the kind of accounting standards that we actually still need to measure how we're going to invest money or wealth or whatever currency, whether it's energy or work or volunteerism into those areas that are essential to the well-being economy. So that was my point. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And thanks, Dodger, for that. D does any of the panel want to come in and in on that one? Just at the points that have been raised. Jen? Yeah, uh, Vicky Roger, you're, you're speaking my language here, definitely. Um, so, so one of the things that I quite like to, um, to, to say in these conversations is to remind people that economics is a social science. It is something that we have socially constructed and we can deconstruct that which we have constructed. And yet something about the way that economics is presented to the world makes it appear as if it is a natural science. It makes it appear that money is a real thing rather than a social construct. And that's what we have to challenge because once we start unpicking all of that, then so many more opportunities arise for us. Now tackling the, the question that Roger put in terms of, you know, can you really measure everything? I think we can measure a lot more now in terms of what really does make life worthwhile. So we can measure whether our children feel loved you know, and that really matters. That's one of the things in the Scottish National Outcomes, and, and I adore it. Um, we know that there are relationships between how many people you can call if you're in an emergency and how you feel generally about your quality of life. And we can measure all of that. But the problem for those of us on the wellbeing economy side is that while we can measure those things, we don't seem to value them in society the same way as we value money. So even though those measurements improve all the time and social scientists talk about them all the time and publish on them all the time, they don't actually change our behaviours because that social construct of the economy as a real and tangible thing rather than something malleable that we can control is far too strong in our society. So thank you to both of you for raising that question. Excellent, excellent questions. Thank you. Jen, I'm just going to open up to the panel beyond that. I, I, Pam just uh, let me know that she needs to go at half past seven. So I'm going to bring Pam in just for some final thoughts from her. I know we're, we're, we're talking about Morris. We've also been joined by Ariane Burgess, who is another MSP. And, and again, we'll, we'll ask uh, uh, Ariane to contribute at the end as well about what her initial thoughts are. But Pam, I know you've got to go, but just what you're just... I suppose your your closing thoughts and, and and kind of where we go from here, what your what your thoughts are, and then I'll open up to the panel. Thank you. Uh, okay, sorry. You know, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for for allowing me to to do this. Um, I I find I find tonight incredibly interesting. Um, as I said earlier on, I think the points that have been made around inequality, participation, and the interconnectedness between um, the the inequality in society and the role that the economy has is is really key. Um, I I would like um, perhaps for the, the the CPG to be looking at um, a, a few other examples, I guess, of um, deliberative um, decision making. I think that's a really um, a really good mechanism that we, that we could use to look at this. I'm also really um, really struck by the, the final comments there by Jen um, on on the way that, that that we consider the economy and, and the fact that it is of course a social science um, and a social construct. Um, and I think we 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 forget that too often. Like even um, I, I Paul and I both sit. I've lost Pam. We may have lost Pam. I'll give it a wee second. I think what Pam was going to say is we both sit in the Social Security Committee. Um, and there's a bit of debate going on just now around about how we're looking at end of, you know, how we, we tackle the cost of living crisis and how we tackle debt. So there's that, that's, yeah, that, there's that whole discussion about how you include people in, in that. So I, I think we may have lost Pam. Um, so I'm going to open up the question. And obviously, that, that, that meant, yeah, we have lost Pam. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to open it up to the panel around about you know the the, the point that was raised uh, around about that, that Vicky and Roger had both said. And if anybody else wants to come in on that, and I'm going to give everybody a suppose a heads up in terms of we're half past seven. I'm going to bring in the, the keynote listeners about quarter to eight. But I'm going to ask each of the panel maybe to 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 have two 
two asks, if you like, around about, or two priorities around about how we can take this agenda forward on the back of this tonight. So just on the point that Rick, Vicky and Roger mentioned, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in and, and uh, address the points that they raised. Margaret? Yes, I think, um, I think they're really important points and they come down to the question of how do we deal with uncertainty? Because even when we have fully developed wellbeing economy dashboards in place, many decisions will still need to be made with incomplete information at hand. Um, and I think particularly long-term investments often suffer from a lack of certainty about outcomes, uh, which is problematic because it means that they're often being discounted because we simply know more about what's happening in the, in the near future. So I absolutely agree that we need to be open and creative in finding new ways to build on the full suite of knowledge that we have, whether it is quantitative or qualitative. Okay, uh, and just on that, uh, um, I'll bring on Rick going to be second. Uh, Matthew, my apologies um, from Friends of the Earth. I know you've been trying to come in. Do you want to raise, is, is it on the same issue or will Rick going to answer and then and go to yourself for another question? It's a slightly different issue. Sorry. It's a different issue. Sorry, Matthew. It's a different issue. Right, it no problem. I'll, I'll bring Rick to answer that question and, and Matthew, then I'll bring in yourself if that's okay. Yeah, Matthew, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. 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 Yeah, just on the general point that uh, Roger made, I mean, I, I fully agree. Basically, any measurement is just an abstraction of something really complex. And one of the things that economists have done really well is to actually, uh, it, there's an illusion that you can measure the economy, uh, but actually for 400 years, there was no agreement on how to measure the economy. So everybody had a different thing and you can't actually look at the economy outside of your window so it's not actually an objective measurement. It's just a, a convention that we have. And I think the same holds for well-being. That well-being, even to ourselves, is such a complex philosophical phenomenon. I mean, it's even difficult to explain to yourself what your own well-being is. So we can only get so far into measure this phenomenon. But I do think it's important to get at least as close as possible to these things. I would like to also say one other thing. Uh, uh, I think um, Vicky talked about accounting schemes. There are a lot of really great accounting schemes for natural capital, which are spreading really fast. And actually the system of national accounts, which governs GDP is actually going to be updated in 2025. And there will actually be chapters on well-being and sustainability. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the people discussing those things. Um, uh, and I think those are really interesting development that even economists of the most standard type are, are seeing that they really need to incorporate a lot of this thinking into kind of national measurement systems that we have. Thank you for that. I'm going to bring in uh, Matthew from uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland. Matthew, sorry for the delay. I, I'll bring in with your question. If you can ask your yeah. question. I would turn on my video if it works, but it's not working. So you have to guess what I look like if you don't know. <laughs> um, I think this has been a really interesting discussion and I've learned quite a lot from it. And, um, but it, it seems that we're talking almost as if um, the economy is driven in the same way that like a, a government or a government department is driven, like you set targets and then you rationally take decisions around how you measure it and so on. <clears throat> and I'm really interested in, in whether we actually do have the measures which could enable a public uh, service to do that. However, the point I want to raise is different, which is that most of the big decisions which are driving the, the issues which we're trying to tackle are taken in the private sector. They're taken in by big finance or they're taken by big enterprises <clears throat> um, or enterprises in general. And um, it seems obvious that, I mean, I think it was really useful that Vicky started talking about accountancy. There's a question of whether, you know, accountants can help us uh, or help uh, businesses uh, take decisions which do drive well-being. However, um, at the moment, I think the purpose of a business is very, very clear. It's nothing to do with well-being. The purpose of a business is very, very clearly to make profit. Uh, and in fact, as a shareholder, sorry, as a, as a board member of a, uh, a business, you would be in trouble if you were not pursuing profit. And it wouldn't be much of an excuse, which, is, which was to say, sorry, we took the wrong decision because we wanted to make life better for people who aren't you know, really uh, uh, members of the company. So my question gets to the point is, to drive a well-being economy, do we have to change 
what we expect of private companies. Do we have to require our private companies to address more than profit for their shareholders? Matty, I think that's a fantastic question. I'm going to open up. One of the things that the group's been talking about is how do we get the, the, the private sector, the business sector involved in the group and the cross-party group and, and being part of these discussions uh, as well. So I think that's a really, really important question and it's got everybody thinking. Does anybody want to, in the panel want to come in on that, first of all? So I, I can just say I put a link in the chat there. There are conversations yep. ongoing about um, introducing changes to the Companies Act at UK level. Of course, those are reserved situations for, for Scotland, um, but to try and move away from the, the primary goal of business being to create financial value. Um, so that's something certainly to watch from up here too. Yeah, Jen, thank you for that. Margaret? Yeah, just really briefly, I think um, it's also interesting in that context to think about the role of social enterprises because in many ways they already sort of embody the new economy and that it's not just for financial for economic um, profit but that there's a social and environmental goal to them as well um, so looking at ways to grow the importance of social enterprises i think um, fits in with rethinking the way business is being done yeah margaret i've, I've seen a comment in the, in the in the chat as well i'll come on to that in a little second denisha Hi, yeah, thank you for all those really helpful comments. I guess um, from a we all perspective, um, this is something, you know, we talk about quite extensively about how we can make sure businesses are doing things differently because they are such a crux of how we function as an economy. Um, and, you know, we believe in four pillars of a wellbeing economy. So we believe in purpose, prevention, predistribution and people power. So that is really the key to what businesses should be doing as well. Um, you know, business do play a vital role in this uh, you look at our allies at um we all we have numerous businesses who have signed up and tried to work with us alongside us because that is really important as well when we're talking about things like this and issues we can't talk about in an echo chamber or in a silo um we need to make sure that we're also bringing them on our journey and community wealth building community um owned companies as well I mean there's really really great stuff all across Scotland that we've been working for and I would really really recommend um I think a few of my colleagues have put some links in the chat but I'd recommend really looking at what what we've done so far it's too much to actually just say in this short segment but I would really really echo kind of what points have been made and I think that is really really important how we make sure that we um incentivize that businesses do come along this journey with us and it isn't just about making a million more billionaires um it is about making sure that absolutely everyone is long in this journey so yeah i really would recommend it Anisha, thank you for that look i'm going to ask you probably yourself but probably the experience in the netherlands you know what was the the private sector involvement in discussions or or, or was there were, were the active players if you like in, in discussions yeah i did also do a bit of work um for businesses and then also large corporations but you saw two problems there the, the same you know businesses do generally just uh, target the profit so it, they didn't really integrate for example when they had metrics they didn't really uh, integrate it into a lot of decision making processes so it would just be a, a publication but i think uh, there is something changing on the continent and that is that um there was also a proliferation of measurement systems about ESG and stuff like that. And now in the European Union, there's a process called the CSRD. And that will actually harmonize the way that these largest companies are supposed to report. And it'll become a, a similar standard as the financial reporting. Uh, because the great thing about financial reporting is that it's so harmonized and it can be audited. And you really need to put a lot of effort into it. Um, and so if the CSRD, it's, it's quite a process to, of course, kind of combine all these uh, CSR measures. Um, but once it's implemented, it will mean that I think uh, tens of thousands of the largest companies in Europe, it'll be compulsory to actually report these numbers in a way that's also auditable. Uh, and then, you know, whether they act on it or do they do not, they will become accountable for the numbers that they are putting out. So I do hope that that is a, um, I, I do believe that that is a good process in the sense of forcing companies to, uh, to actually be accountable for what they are doing in a harmonized way 
and uh, being forced to actually publish these numbers, uh, I think will be a good step. Yeah, I think I think the point you just mentioned there is vitally important. We need to bring in that that sector. There, there was a couple of comments that I've just kind of touched on as well. Then I'm going to come to probably the, the panel for probably you know what are the two most important things you think we should be doing in Scotland to to, to, to progress that forward. Then I'll come to uh, the, the panel. Morris, I know my, uh, Maggie Chapman's just joined us as well, and Ariane Burgess just on, on their observations uh, around about that. Uh, Danny Craig, you both mentioned about obviously the, the importance of either the cooperative model or social enterprise model as well in, in terms of that. So I think that's a really important thing. And just for everybody's um, interest, um, there is going to be a joint meeting of the cross-party groups on circular economy, which uh, Morris the chairs. I chair the cross-party group on social enterprises and also chair the cross-party group on this. So we're going to have a, a joint cross-party group meeting on this because they are all interlinked. So I think that's really important. So watch, watch this space for more detail uh, on that. But I think... Just on that, I don't know if anybody briefly wants to touch on the, the role of the third sector, social enterprises within the panel, then I'll come on and maybe ask you if you just to touch on that and also talk about the two most important things you think we should be doing in Scotland to progress the agenda. Um, and I'll probably just go through the, the, in the order that I've got here in front of me. Jen, I don't know if you want to comment on that. On the third sector role? On the third sector and what you see the two most important things we should be doing yeah 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 so the third sector absolutely um critical to the agenda of trying to drive scotland forward i mean i'm a member of an ngo you know and i've been you know sort of chairing communities of, of others um i think the challenge for a lot of those organizations is that they are so small that they're working under a contract system that doesn't value all the added value that they provide to scotland's well-being so you know at the moment that neoliberal model of procurement and processing small contracts and grants means that they're locked into a system where they can't feel they can't really give all the benefit that they would like to give so i hope for them in particular you know that a well-being economy approach would allow them to deliver as much as they're possibly able to for Scotland and for that to be valued in all of these conversations and not just for the financial benefit but for everything else that they do for all of us so the, um, the the two uh, sort of points that I would leave with one um, just just to restress that that there are opportunities coming up to engage on the national outcomes and, and hopefully also on the wellbeing economy monitor and I think it's really important that we all use our voices you know to call for greater involvement and participation in those processes that those can't just be you know sort of internal um, processes in the Scottish government um, and, and just processes managed by statisticians but they're about all of us and about what we want for the country that we live in um, and I think the other point that I wanted to make was uh, not so much an action but a, a reflection having been in this field for, for a while now and um, that we have already come so far and sometimes it's really hard to remember that because we can see how far we have to go and we're not Wales and we're not New Zealand but we're doing really really well and I think if we look back on where we were you know 10 years ago we would be quite impressed with where we are so please keep you know keep keep the faith and keep trucking on because changes are happening even if they do feel a little bit slow sometimes thank you Jen, thank you for that. Just to mention that the, the link to that joint cross-party group has been in the chat, so if you're keen on that, then obviously sign up for that one. Rutger, I'm going to ask you, obviously, around about the third sector and, and what your, your two key observations or two actions are from tonight. Yeah, so in terms of the two observations or advice, or I would say let's. it would be great if Scotland could create some kind of process that combined a deliberative process to the scientific statistical process. And I would also suggest that perhaps this we go alliance that there is, because this is pioneering work, right? As Jen said, we have come a quite a long way, but at the same time, there's loads of things to discover about, you know, these deliberative processes, about policy processes. So in a sense, I would also say, you don't need to uh, find out all of those things by yourself. And you actually have this um, We Go Alliance with some of the leaders like Wales and, and New Zealand. And it, as an outsider to that process, it doesn't seem as if uh, it's being leveraged enough. I think there's loads of, and even in the Netherlands, we also have a process with our wellbeing economy monitor. So there's actually loads of experiences that you could learn from. Um, and so you don't need to, kind of go it alone, but rather let's also see this as a global process um, where we actually teach each other what works and doesn't. Good, thank you for that. And, and any thoughts on the third sector where you see the involvement of the third sector as part of this? 
I'm going to be honest, but I think the third sector does a lot of good, um, but I'm also really focused on uh, the sectors that do a lot of bad, uh, and those are basically the large companies. So in terms of my priorities in thinking, I do actually think that the uh, third sector does so much good, it's wonderful, but when I'm thinking about climate change, I'm thinking about the big companies that do are doing so much bad, rather. So um not i don't have that many reflections on the third sector sorry because thank you for that I, i'm going to bring in margaret and indonesia just on on the same question i'm, I'm going to give the heads up to my, my colleagues to to, to morris to, to um to ariane and, and to, to maggie just on what their final thoughts are or, or, or observations are on for the night maggie i know you've just joined us but you're, you're just your thoughts on that and then we'll, we'll close it margaret uh, your thoughts again on on you know possibly the third sector but also your two main observations or asks or, or thoughts from tonight <laughs> um yeah i think in terms of two main recommendations i think the importance of going beyond metrics so the of course it is really important to establish a sound um, measurement framework um, and I know a lot of work has happened there already, and I think, um, like Jen has said as well, it's amazing and that should be celebrated as well. There have been so many, so many uh, great things that have been achieved, um, which is fantastic. Um, I think the point about how to integrate it into policy decision making is really key to then put those metrics into action. Um, yeah, I think the well-being budget has been one mechanism that I've seen how, how that is a really powerful lever to, to help achieve that. Um, at the same time, I think, um, I mean, there's so many inspiring, like the others have said as well, there are so many inspiring initiatives happening around the world. Um, and so it feels like different pockets around the world are solving different pieces of the puzzle, um, which is why I think we all plays a really important role in helping to bring that together. Um, so learning, yeah, so connecting to all those different other countries and governments and businesses and who are trying to solve um, similar issues, I think is really important. Um, and I think also looking beyond um, perhaps dashboards themselves, but also looking at other mechanisms like uh, I take a lot of inspiration from the Wales Welding of Future Generations Act, you know, in relation to that point about how do we embed long term decision or long term considerations in our decision making. Perhaps a welding framework in and of itself is not necessarily enough to help do that, even though it does encourage quite, um, more systematic consideration. Having somebody knocking on that door to hold people accountable is a really powerful mechanism as well. Um, yeah, so lots to learn, I think, from different places around the world. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Denisha, again, and just to mention, uh, I think in chat it's mentioned about uh, Jimmy Paul, we all mentioned about the impact of the, or the role of the third sector in a well-being economy, so there's a report that's there if people are interested in that as well. But Denisha, just in your thoughts on the third sector and also your, your two final observations, if you like, then I'll come to my, my MSP colleagues. Thanks, Paul. Um, so yeah, the third sector question is an interesting one. Um, I've I work in the third sector, I've worked in third sector since I was probably about 18, um, so I kind of feel like I live and breathe it now, to be honest, but uh, yeah, I think we do have a really important role to play in building a wellbeing economy, and we all, Scotland as well, is a charity, so we are in the third sector as well, and um, Jimmy Paul um, has been referenced in a, a wee article there, um, I would recommend you read it, me and him talk quite a lot about this, and so do the rest of my colleagues at we all as well, about well, actually, what does it mean to be third sector and be a charity? And charities are usually set up as a response to a failure of something that has went wrong. They are set up to address a need that is currently not being addressed by government policy or legislation or, or respond to a need. We saw that particularly during COVID of how third sector really stepped up and rallied around, whether it be NHS, other public services, gathered around and really, really had that community aspect to it and I think that's really key uh, we talk about this a lot and actually when we set up a charity and we have our goals we should be working to make ourselves obsolete so in terms of we should be working to make sure yes right now we're addressing an issue whether that be children in care people in poverty people who need that extra bit of help and need that support and need someone to fight in their corner because traditionally they haven't had that um, and we need to be doing that right now, yes, but we should work to make sure that we're building a world that in 10 years' time we don't need the charity anymore. And that's quite scary to accept, I guess, our, our obsolescence and accepting the fact that 
there might not be a need for our job anymore. Um, but that is what is the right thing to do. So and that's not about saying um, you, not not about saying yeah. Well, we give ourselves ten years to resolve absolutely everything that's wrong, and then after that we don't do anything. It's about making sure we're doing what we can that leaves a legacy that protects future generations. And I talk about this quite a lot in my role on the Future Generations Commission as well. Of really actually we do need to be doing something that is going to leave a better yet a better tomorrow than it does yesterday and i think that really comes down to as well instead of thinking downstream of um okay well here are our problems how can we patch them up how can we respond right now and be reactive instead of thinking like that and thinking in that and i always find this really funny actually when it comes to the economy because that's more expensive long term we you know this is more expensive look up the human economic cost model of the independent care review if you haven't already um but we know it's more expensive to get this wrong right now, long term. So actually, if we work right now and get it right for social issues, regardless of what that is, we know it's going to benefit future generations. And I think the third sector has one of the biggest roles to play in that because we're all working for people and we're so close to that. So I think in a nutshell, that's kind of what I see the third sector doing. Um, and I also say this is someone quite, you know, the early stage of my career that I've chosen a path that means I will constantly be part of jobs but you know that's the future I'm determined to make and determined to make something that's better for my children my grandchildren and I think that's really important and I think coming back to Paul's point about two things I'd like to see um I, I heard this quote once it's always stuck with me and it was that we should always give those who are most marginalized whether that be children people of color LGBT people people with disabilities a seat at the table but if the table doesn't work for them throw it out the window and sit on the floor. And I think that's something really, really important that's always stuck with me is that we need to make sure that what we're talking and when we're reaching out to people, we do it in a way that's comfortable and safe and suitable for them. We're not expecting people to come to us. If you want to hear about participation, real experiences, what matters to people, we need to make sure we're doing that. We're going to people and we're working around them and we're building the system around them and what matters to them. And I think that's really the key. And I would always kind of champion that. Second point, I think how do we I think I would really encourage, and particularly for politicians, parliamentarians and councillors who are here today, and also anyone who might have a leading role as a decision maker, we need to work in hindsight. And I just touched on that point previously as well, but we need to make sure we're future-proofing our policies. We're making sure that when we're talking about building something, we're working in hindsight of what that's going to mean in five months, five years, and we're future-proofing it because that's really important. You look at when there has been failures in terms of policies, legislation or, or organisations, the failures do stem from the fact we didn't prepare or we didn't think far enough. And that doesn't mean that we set something up and we leave it and review it again in 10 years. It means we also make sure that we're constantly re-evaluating, making sure we can refine it and make it better and better and better because there is no end stop. There is no one solution. It's about how we can keep growing and keep learning. And I think that's really important. Denisha, thank, thank you for that. And, and I was going to, the point I was going to, I was going to maybe ask yourself, or Lucas or Lisa, I know the report that, that, that we all had produced, the failure demand report, which addresses a point. I, I don't know if you can send a link to that because it's a, it's a fantastic report that, that kind of came through. And uh, if that's okay, what, one just on a quote as well, and I'm, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Lynn Jardin, Lynn's, Lynn's my office manager. One of the things that she mentioned, we, we, we've heard the phrase hard to reach, but it, the, the, the other part, it, it, it's easy to ignore. And, and you know, for too often we've ignored we've ignored the people who are easy to ignore. And this is, you know, this is what we're all trying to do. And it, it mentions the point, Tanisha, that, you, that you've talked about. So I think that's a really important point. I, I'm going to um, uh, bring in my colleagues. I'm going to come to, to Maurice first, and then Ariane, and then uh, and then Maggie, just to end about the final thoughts. So Maurice, I don't know. If you're, if you're still here, just your, your, your thoughts on, on tonight, I, I find this absolutely intriguing and a real challenge for us to, to, to do that. But I don't know what your final thoughts are on, on what we've heard tonight. Yeah, I think it's been excellent and, and really interesting and some marvellous insights. I thought um, Denisha's point around not talking academic language was very important, backed up by Meg, who highlighted the national performance framework and that we need to speak in a language that people understand. And I think if you asked a community organization to deliver a well-being economy, they would come up with specific actions that would help the local community. And if you asked a civil servant, they would come up with the national performance framework. Um, I think there's a balance between both. I don't think you need uh, one needs to be mutually exclusive of the other, but I think 
it's essential that you communicate what the well-being economy means to me, means to the people on this call and the, the people of Scotland and what a difference it would make to them and their lives and how they would function and how it, they would interact with business and communities and how they would consume. And uh, I thought uh, on a separate point, I thought Jen uh, initially spoke about uh, debates and what um, uh, terms were mentioned and carbon footprint was one of the lowest terms and that's no surprise because I was shadow economy secretary in the last session and I hardly ever got to lead a, lead a debate because there's very few debates about climate change. And then uh, I stopped being um, uh, that position and suddenly COP26 comes across and we've got three debates in about a month. Uh, and, and then suddenly very little again. So I think that there is a, an issue around what we debate in parliament uh, and therefore what terms are, are mentioned. And I, I actually think you know, more um, debates around the well-being economy, what that means, what parties think about that would be uh, very beneficial. Uh, Marguerite talked about long-term planning and uh, how that can benefit the well-being economy. And Rutger mentioned that the metrics are at least going in the right direction. And I know we've had the debate about whether you need metrics, how you do that, um, um, but, I've got to tell you, when I was studying economics 20 years ago, my professor said GDP is God. And it's heartening to note that we've actually moved beyond that now. And at least there are some further considerations around social enterprises, ESG, B Corps. And, you know, that is very beneficial. I still think the private sector is an issue. I did my thesis on whether corporate social responsibility was a smokescreen. Um, my conclusions was that uh, on the balance of the evidence, it probably was. Um, but that was a number of years ago, and perhaps things have changed. I suspect not. But we are seeing some movement in the private sector for day week. We're seeing uh, a, a number of shifts, um, which is beneficial. But I think we also need to consider both in the private sector and the uh, public sector, including agencies around uh, issues of transparency, around bullying, harassment, sickness absence, because that's indicative uh, metrics of a company that's or organization that's operating in the wrong way. Um, in terms of the third sector, final point, Paul, um, is you know, it's been beset by short-term planning, by only being able to plan their funding for a year. I think we need to extend that. How on earth can you, we move, and I know I'm veering off to my pet project of the circular economy, but how on earth can we move to a circular economic model if you're doing year-by-year -year funding? If you're year-by-year -year funding, you have to purchase outright uh, any goods and, uh, and pay them back within that period. You cannot move to a rental or a leasing model. And the absolute final point on that is that we have to use public procurement to ensure that the well-being economy is funded appropriately. So we're not asking for extra funds, although we are, but not as part of this particular argument. Uh, what we want to do is ensure that the existing funding, because all governments are under pressure on funding, the existing funding that's already being used should be used to fund the circular economy and the well-being economy. And we need to ensure that public sector procurement officers, whether local authority, public agencies, are trained to completely and utterly change their outlook on how they procure goods and services, and I think that will ultimately help the third sector, the well-being economy, and indeed the circular economy. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for that. Ariane, I know you joined us slightly late, but I don't know if you've just your observations on what, what you've heard uh, tonight. 
Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't think I'm really a keynote listener because I think I missed all of the keynotes by the time I joined. And the reason I missed the keynotes was because I was busy in the rural um, um, CPG uh, listening to keynotes about rural economy issues. And, and in, in there, there were six people talking about how they can do more with less. And a lot of them were third sector organizations. So um, I think I was thinking, oh, it would have been great if we all come together um, around um, the you know it's, it's connected conversation, of course, uh, with with folks there trying to figure out how to um, you know ensure well being of rural communities, which uh, uh, being the Highlands and Islands MSP is something that I'm always busy with. Um, so I kind of joined in where there were various comments and discussions uh, about. Uh, I think I came in where there was a discussion around kind of community engagement and the importance of early engagement and having been involved in that kind of work before I got elected. Um, I, I absolutely agree with that. It's kind of, uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we hear, Paul, in our committee, the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, is the kind of engagement, the um, consultation fatigue. And, and my sense of that is people are not engaged early enough um, to feel that it is something that, that they have the ownership of, that it's something that they have co-created, that they or, or they have initiated and created and are being you know, supported to actually bring forward. So um, I kind of agree with, I, I agree with that whole piece around the early engagement. And I'm sorry, I, I can't remember who was actually uh, speaking about that, but I think probably everybody touched on it. But I also equally, I think one of the things I've been, um, reflecting on or wondering about when when we start to bring a lot of work get, uh, that I was doing was you know, involved in community engagement and the kind of like the lived experience and then there's this piece for me of like you know lived experience works to a point um, and I you know but if you're only just looking at your local little bit of lived experience and you're not seeing other things that are happening in other places then maybe we're missing pieces of the whole picture so there's something about a balance in there and and I, and I think that I think that again also what was brought up, which I agree with, is that we absolutely need to find ways to measure quality, not just the spreadsheet and and the, the bottom line or the triple bottom line or whatever, but we absolutely need to find different ways uh, of, of of valuing and measuring quality experiences. Um, and then I think the other thing, Jen, you brought this up, and I think it's the bottom line for me is that it is really understanding that. The economy is a human construct. We can change it. It was designed by humans. It's deeply, deeply embedded. Uh, so we all believe, or uh, many people believe, it is real. Uh, and and we, I remember the first time I was studying e economics, and, and and this kind of was brought to me. It was a really, it was literally a mind blowing experience, because you know, because I had grown up with this idea of the economy, and then to kind of understand that, well, actually, it's not real, and we can change it. So I think I, I, what I love about the work with the well-being approach uh, and other approaches that are questioning the economy is, um, you know, it, it's just kind of saying there is another way to do it. And, and we urgently need to do that because of the things that have been brought up, Matthew, you know, brought in climate and, and the um, nature emergency, but also the fundamental issue that people are not well-being. So we're absolutely doing something wrong. And at the bottom of it is the economy. Every time I think about something, that's where I go. And that's what we need to change. It's so fundamental. So I'm sorry I missed the keynotes, um, but really great to touch in uh, on the conversation. No, Jan, thank you for that. That's that really helpful. Maggie, I know you joined us. I joined us late. I mean, knew you were joining us uh, in us late. So thanks for, for popping on. I, I don't know if you're just uh, on your general thoughts on the well-being economy and obviously this has been recorded so we'll get the recording to you and the chat's going to be sent out to everybody as well so i think there's some really good chats but any initial any thoughts maggie just on what you've heard so far or or, or just on general in the well-being economy uh, thanks very much paul and good evening everyone sorry to join so late um i was in a, a another a parliamentary meeting on on gender sensitive audits and that was something that I felt, being the equality spokesperson for the Greens, that I, I needed to to make make sure I I, I was there for. Um, I will definitely catch up with the recording and and have have chats with Morris and, and Paul over over the coming um, days and, and weeks about this. I think a, a couple of things that struck me. I, I came in just as as folk were 
talking that, that final round of questions, I think, around the role of the third sector and, and how valuable that is. And uh, Denisha, nice to see you again. Your point about obsolescence, I think, is, is one that's really, really well made. Um, I think, I, I think though, I, that there is probably also a role for a non-state or uh, non-state organization, so third sector or something else to support things where state intervention actually isn't appropriate. So, so I think I think there is a role beyond uh, capturing state failure um, for, for, for th third sector organizations. But but more broadly, I, I think one of one of the things that I, I was thinking of listening to to Morris, Ariane and, and, and others speak is the the ability to deal with risk. The ability to deal with political risk. Morris talked about, you know, yearly funding and annual funding cycles being really restrictive. One of one of the things that I think is is fundamental, we, we absolutely have to change is the the approach to um, to. to solving problems in a departmental way. I think um, Mariana Mazzucato talks about a mission-based approach and this joins up, uh, you know, super policies, if you like, or actually it's it's outcome focused. It's about making sure that the outcome is, is what matters. And some of that outcome will be quantifiable, but much of that outcome won't be quantifiable. And I think I think the desire to measure everything is, is also something that we, we need to shift. It, it, it's a, a, a structural framework that, that we need to move, move away from. So joining things up, seeing where, seeing where and how things align, I, th I think is really, really important if we are to tackle um, the, the big challenges of our time, whether that's the climate emergency, whether that's COVID, whatever it is. I think COVID actually gives us a really useful real life lesson of, of how to deal with this. You know, it, it was a health crisis, but it was also a social security crisis. It was also uh, an employment crisis. It was a digital poverty crisis. It was all of these things wrapped up in one and trying to solve it in individual budget lines of any one governmental or local government or third sector um, department just does not work. And I think, as as we look at as we look to tackle the biggest issues that that humanity has ever faced, I think we you know as, as we look to future proof our our policy making processes as well because we won't get all the policies right. We we need to future proof the processes. Um, I think th th that there has to be that. Uh, cutting across and cutting through and breaking down the siloed mentality of virtually all policy and strategy work that happens in, in uh, across public policy. And that comes back to the point about political risk, because it's very, very difficult. It's very challenging for any politician to stand up and say that this is what they're going to do, because we've done it the way we've done it for so long, for so many years. It's so deeply entrenched. This is just how we do things that that I think that there's, there's something there's re something really quite um, fundamental in, in that. And I think that links to the broader, to somebody else made the point about planning and the importance of actually getting planning right and, and seeing how different plans connect. And I think we, we've got so out of the habit of planning, you know, a, a, a across across the board. We saw that initially in March 2020 when, when COVID hit. We, we've seen that with the climate emergency. We, we, we see that in so many different elements. We've, we've lost the expertise around what planning means, how, how you future-proof your planning as well. So, so for me, if we are to move towards a well-being economy, if we are to completely restructure what our economy is and what it is for, and I think we have to do that in order to get to a well-being economy, then we need to take, we need to understand risk, we need to understand planning, and we need to understand that kind of mission-based or, or non-siloed approach to, to policy and, and strategy development. Thanks. Maggie, thank you for that. I, I, folks, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I know we're slightly over uh, schedule. A, a few key things, I think, for me, and, and, and I'd agree with them that my, my colleagues have, have said and, and, and what's been said tonight. I think one of the key things, obviously, is interconnectivity policy policymaking. I think that's incredibly important. And since being elected a, a year ago, one of the key things, I think, for me, this job is all about joining the dots. And how, how do we do that? You know, it can't be in silos. Policymaking can't be in silos. I think. Um, somebody mentioned the point about the strength of community involvement. It can communities that can drive this forward. And I've met many organisations in here that have been involved both in my own area and, and in Scotland that, that are really driving from the bottom up. So 
us to be, you know, we have to recognise that and, and just facilitate that as well. There's a lot, lots of good organisations that, that are there. And obviously the metrics are, are going to be key. You know, I, I, I don't want to hear in four years' time uh, when this parliament, you know, it comes comes to an, an end, uh, the session comes to an end, and we're still talking about the same thing. I want to make sure that we look back on this in four years' time and we've made real progress, and that's up to all of us to, to do that, but particularly on, on the politicians. So I, I just want to say a massive thank you to, to, the, to the panel and um, to my MSP colleagues, everybody that's joined tonight. I, I found this absolutely in, intriguing uh, and, and really motivated me even more to try and push push for this. Uh, I think in promoting the, the cross-party group, um, you know, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion tonight. You know, hopefully you can join the group on, 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 on a longer term basis and come along at any time you, you possibly can. We mentioned about the joint event that we're having, and we we'll hope to organise more events where we can have this this level of discussion and, and do that, and hopefully have some at some stage have some kind of event. I think I would hope in the Parliament where we can we can continue this. So, just to say thank you very much eh, for coming along. We do have the recording. We are going to send out the notes in the chat as well. If there's any questions for any of the MSPs, then please eh, ask us eh, and some of the of the panelists. But eh, unless anybody's getting else to say this, saying and again just to say thanks to to Lucas and and, and to Lynn and colleagues that. Uh, we all as well to say thank you for organising this tonight. I found this really uh, incredibly uh, interesting, incredibly exciting. So just to say a massive thank you uh, and enjoy your evening. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.